So welcome to the Connecting Co-Curricular Resources webinar hosted by Epic N. Uh, before we get underway, I'd like to introduce our organization and this programming that we offer to you. Uh, the Epic Network is a nonprofit association that supports institutions using the Epic model to facilitate high impact, large scale university community partnerships. Uh, our acronym stands for the Educational Partnerships for Innovation in Communities Network. And that's really what we're all about, helping educational entities partner with their local communities to innovate and create solutions. Epic N supports university programs across the globe that connect to their local city, county, community groups, other local government forums, special districts, uh, and we help them connect with their universities to find human capital that might not be uh, uh, used currently to improve the quality of life for all that are in their communities. These webinars were created to improve the support offerings provided by our, to our paying EPIC member programs. This is a special webinar that we've opened up to anyone interested in, and thank you so much for those of you who are joining. The webinars bring expert guests to share on topics and I'm really excited about our guests for today. Members can attend the live taping, which you all are doing, uh, or the review the recordings, which some of you might be doing also as well <laughs> in the future. The recordings will be posted to the Epic End member comments uh, and future call topics will be posted on our Epic End events page, which uh, is www.epicend/events. The series is made possible by uh, the following folks, our member programs, uh, the Ford Foundation and the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. My name is Marshall Curry and I'm the Epic End program manager and I'll be uh, moderating our webinar today. Before I begin, I have to do a little bit of context and introduce the model that all of our institutions use to some degree. It's the EPIC model. We respect existing administrative structures. We create genuine partnerships. We intentionally aim at improving quality of life. Our projects are community identified first and foremost, and then fit to meet the university faculty's interests. And they must be large in number. We're not talking super large. Uh, uh, university of Mississippi is about to present on how they went big their first year. Some of our programs start a little smaller, but it's not one-off projects. I'm going to dive into the first one a little bit because it's going to be relevant to our conversation today. Regarding our existing administrative structures and individual responsibilities and incentives on all sides, we really focus on using existing courses. And that if you want to, you can add co-curricular resources on your university's campus to do more. But in order to qualify as an EPIC program, you must use existing courses where relevant. With those existing courses, it's an opt-in model for faculty and co-curricular resources as well. Using mostly existing syllabi, we don't want to ask faculty to do more because it increases their barrier to entry. And a lot of our network members have seen really great results in getting faculty who are uh, have a harder time getting into service learning, they'll do an EPIC program because the barrier to entry is lower. Now, the reason why I'm bringing these up is because Laura and Taylor are about to present, our, our presenters today are about to present on how they've used a lot of what's in the model and also added to it using a lot of other resources and skills that their office brings to really help us innovate the model and really meet the needs of the, their constituents in Mississippi. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speakers. Uh, Laura Martin serves as the Associate Director of the McLean Institute for Public Service and Community Engagement, where she works to advance transformation through service at the university and fight poverty through education in Mississippi. In this capacity, she also directs M Partner, a community engagement initiative that aligns university resources with community identified projects to improve quality of life. M Partner is the EPIC program at the University of Mississippi. Taylor Robertson is an AmeriCorps VISTA serving with the M Partner program at the University of Mississippi. Taylor supports the work of M Partner by helping build the bridge between university professors and campus organizations to enter Mississippi communities. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to them. Laura, Taylor, why don't you take it away? Marshall, um, thank you so much for this opportunity. And we're really, really excited to visit with all of you guys this afternoon um, or morning, depending on where you are. Um, so I'm going to, I think, frame a little bit about the McLean Institute and how we came to be a part of the EPIC network. This is still very, very new to our community and so, um, or to our, to our campus community. And so everything that I'm gonna be talking about and that Taylor's gonna be sharing is actually from 
the pilot phase of mPartner, which began in March of 2018. Um, but before diving into that, just a little bit of background about who we are and where we work. Um, we are aligned with the College of Liberal Arts at the University of Mississippi, and we work at the McLean Institute for Public Service and Community Engagement. So the McLean Institute was founded in 1984 by Dr. Vaughn Grisham, who is a beloved professor of sociology. And um, he studied rural community and economic development. He studied leadership development. And he really seized upon the Tupelo model in Northeast Mississippi as a way that a town that had very little in terms of natural resources or industry or transportation hubs or tourism, the sort of the claim to fame is that that is Elvis's birthplace. Um, but McLean really saw that the strength of the community was in its people, um, that that was the, the richest source of, of capital was human capital. Um, and so he went about developing Tupelo in a very intentional way to the extent that it was um, a, a very thriving economy in the state of Mississippi and kind of stands as this model in the region. So we, we inherited this phenomenal legacy um, from George McLean, from Dr. Grisham, and in 2012, the Institute was really rebranded and expanded to have both a campus-wide and a statewide mission. And so as you see, our mission is to advance transformative service throughout the university in a way that seeks to fight poverty through education. And at the core of our vision um, really is the role of, of mutually beneficial or reciprocal community partnerships. And so you can start to see how Epic M um, is a really, really neat fit within that, that mission and that vision. And so another thing that I noticed, I've attended the Epic N conference one time last spring. And um, you know, I think I really align the, the work. I, I come from the public policy world, but since I joined the university in 2013, I think I really have come to align with the community engagement movement within higher education. And so um, you know, I recognize that we, we have to attend to the outcomes of our work, which are very important. And I know, um, you know, I hear that, that Trevor is interested in the success stories, right? Like how can we, how can we create results? And that's so, so central to the EPIC model. Um, but I also work in Mississippi and we work in communities that have experienced systemic um, injustice and oppression and barriers to economic mobility. So I recognize that a successful program can coexist with very real structural impediments. And so to me, you know, we need to attend to the process just as much as we attend to our outcomes. Um, and I think that within community engagement, the Epic M model is a really beautiful, elegant, and efficient way to do that. So um, I guess one more thing I'll say before I kick it over to Taylor, just to kind of frame some of what we'll be talking about is that in my early years at the McLean Institute, we spent a lot of time promoting service learning. It's just what Marshall said. Um, you know, we, we were excited about this pedagogy that blended academic rigor and intentional partnerships and reflection on service. And we had very little traction among faculty. Uh, the University of Mississippi is the flagship university in the state. We very recently, um, you know, attained the very high research classification from the Carnegie uh, foundation, we also just got the community engagement recognition, which was super exciting um, and very, very validating of our work. The F our M partner program was all over that. Um, but anyway, as soon as we put together the list of projects for M partner, people were coming out of the woodwork and seeking me out and seeking out the McLean Institute to, to learn how they could get their classes involved. And so that's when I think I really, really became converted to this approach because I had been looking for a way to institutionalize a culture of engagement and a commitment to the public good in Mississippi. And that was just, it kind of came along for free when we rolled out M Partner. So that is something that I would offer to those of you like Franco and Trevor that are thinking about um, initiating this, this approach and this, this type of program at your respective universities. Okay, one more before I kick it over to Taylor. So in the community engagement literature, we talk about transactional and transformational partnerships. And we've sort of adapted this nested model that um, you'll kind of hear more about our different programs, which are connected to how we have incorporated a co-curricular component to M Partner. 
But you know, as a, as a student of community engagement, I I initially found myself aligning with these transformational, aspirational initiatives. Right, we're fighting poverty in Mississippi. We have to make a long term commitment. Um, you know, we have to have these open ended partnerships, which, to be honest is how the McLean Institute operates. And I think that approach is very much embedded in, in the apparatus of the Institute. Yet, as partners sits alongside other programmatic initiatives that we have very intentionally clustered in certain parts of the state so that we are able to concentrate our resources and generate um, efficiencies and collaborations where those did not exist prior to making these very intentional partnerships with elected officials. And so um, another thing I've really come to see, and this is oddly enough very, very consistent with the work that George McLean did in Tupelo, the namesake for our institute, you know, his approach was start small with an attainable goal, generate momentum, and go big from there. And to me, really, a partner and the EPIC model have facilitated that strategy, wherein we're not asking faculty to do anything big or intimidating, which I think they, they did in some, in some way internalize when we started using the service learning language. Um, and that's happening, right? But they are generating these wins and these successes. And so this thing has just, as we've seen in our pilot, phase, it has legs, and I feel like a partner has just taken on this life of its own, um, which has been really, really exciting to see. Okay, I keep saying I'm going to kick it over to Taylor. I forgot I added these other slides. <laughs> okay, because I wanted y'all to know, um, you know, again, M partner sits alongside other initiatives, one of which is our SEED program. We call it SEED for short because the full title is Catalyzing Entrepreneurship and Economic Development. This is, this is a co-curricular program, right? So I know we're using our existing infrastructure and apparatus at the McLean Institute. So I wanted just to share a little bit about what exactly that is. Um, but through the SEED program, we provide scholarships to undergraduates and fellowships to graduate students who work with us for one to two years, including the summers, to research the entrepreneurial ecosystem in Mississippi and um, develop actionable partnerships with communities across the state. So SEED definitely has raised our profile um, across, across the state to be sure. And then some of those key statewide initiatives that are part of SEED are the entrepreneurial leadership program for high school students and then business webinars that we offered in communities in partnership with the Mississippi Development Authority and the Entrepreneur Center. And when, when MDA wanted to roll out those webinars in communities last fall, we said, that sounds great. We're starting this new initiative called our partner. Why don't we work together? And so we actually held webinars and were able to feature local businesses in each of our partner communities. And so that's an example of how we've really been intentional about merging existing programs at the McLean Institute to um, generate momentum for M partner in the pilot phase. Okay, now I'm kicking it over to Taylor. <laughs> All right, so um, AmeriCorps VISTA is a federal service program that focuses on fighting poverty through education. Um, the connections to EPIC are kind of obvious there, just in that description alone. Um, but AmeriCorps VISTA is another strategy through which we have built momentum and capacity in our partner communities. AmeriCorps VISTA members serve full time for a year at nonprofit organizations or local government ag agencies to build the capacity of these organizations to create and expand. Um, programs that alleviate poverty and improve the quality of life. The North Mississippi VISTA project is the VISTA project that is housed at the McLean Institute. You'll see a reference in that uh, model we showed two slides ago. Um, North, North Mississippi VISTA project covers 28 counties in the state of Mississippi, um, which is roughly 34% 34, 34 of the counties in the state. Um, AmeriCorps VISTA members engage in indirect service meaning that our job is to build the capacity of these organizations to carry out programs that alleviate poverty. Um, for example, an AmeriCorps VISTA member would build a program to recruit, train, and maintain volunteers for the nonprofit organization that they are serving at, rather than doing all the volunteer work themselves. Um, I think that a common issue in community engagement work is the community's desire to have programs in place, but lacking the capacity to sustain these programs. Um, that's one way AmeriCorps VISTA has been a valuable tool in, in partner efforts. 
AmeriCorps VISTA members also help in a partner program create and sustain community relationships and allow us to find many more ways to collaborate with and within our partners. So, how do AmeriCorps VISTA and community engagement connect? Well, a relatively simple way to communicate the connection between community engagement and AmeriCorps VISTA is through the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We've probably all heard, all heard of these. But kind of real simply, the, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, are a set of 17 goals that were agreed upon by UN member countries to solve some of humanity's biggest challenges. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure that we can relate almost all the SDGs we do for us that would do. Um, Y'all calling you could probably relate all the ones we do as well. Um, but the two that really stand out to our program specifically are SDG number one, ending poverty in all its forms everywhere and SDG number four, ensuring inclusive and equitable quality education and promoting lifelong learning opportunities for all. The Sustainable Development Goals and all of our efforts to support the achievement of these goals, whether they're outlined in our program merit statements or publications or not, um, show a larger global effort to achieve a global society that can be defined as equitable, inclusive, and sustainable. So another way to make the connection um, between VISTA and community engagement is through the common goal of facilitating and supporting a sustainable social system where everyone can enjoy a good quality of life, all of which can, summed up, can be summed up as social sustainability. Um, I really like this definition from the Western Australia Council of Social, social Services at the bottom of this slide. Um, <clears throat> I think a really important Part of this definition of social sustainability is that it calls not just for equity, diversity, and accessibility now, but also for all future generations. Um, the model in the middle of the slide is called the Green Message of Tenancy Model of Sustainability. I think this model paints a better picture of the connections between community engagement work, national service programs like AmeriCorps VISTA, and social sustainability than the, S than the SDGs do alone. Um, the ne this nesting model ultimately can be summed up as showing three things. One, that the current and future well-being of communities and the human, social, cultural aspects that make up those communities are interconnected um, with the well-being of the Earth. Two, that the current and future well-being of the human, social environment, aka communities, is interdependent on the ability of an economic system to support those communities through employment, innovation, industry, and trade. Three, that current and future economic sustainability is dependent on the environment's ability to support the industry, jobs, and trade required to support the economic activity for current and future generations. <laughs> when you look at the program themes of the work of the Impartner Program, that the Impartner Program does, uh, beautification, economic development, education, community health and well-being, you can see them all connecting throughout this model. Same thing with VISTA. We can plug in our work into this model to a, in a variety of different ways and see that it's all interconnected inter and interdependent to social sustainability. Throughout the course of this work, I feel like I have seen firsthand the synergy that is produced through the combined efforts of a community engagement initiative like Impartner, a national service and program like AmeriCorps VISTA, and the concept of social sustainability. Whether it is clearly defined in the mission or values or not, Social sustainability is at the heart of AmeriCorps VISTA and is at the heart of community engagement work that is intentional, non exploitative, and inclusive. National service programs like AmeriCorps VISTA have an incredible ability to support and elevate the work of community engagement programs like Impartner and vice versa. So, Taylor came to the McLean Institute through the Office of Sustainability at the <laughs> University of Mississippi, and it was really, really neat just in our initial. Our first couple of weeks, I want to say, of working together, we had so many conversations about community engagement and sustainability, and it reminded me so much of the themes that I heard at the Epic End Conference, um, of sort of where, where these different ends of the continuum start to come together. So I am now going to talk about the M-Partner pilot phase. So M-Partner, as you all know, is our Epic End program housed at the University of Mississippi. The way that we talk about it is that it is a framework for university and community folks to work together to advance priority projects and partner cities across the state. So as you can see, um, we are located in Oxford, Mississippi. We identified three partner communities for the pilot phase, Charleston and Tallahatchie County, Lexington and Holmes County, and New Albany and Union County. 
Of these three communities, McLean had been working pretty intensively in Charleston. Um, but before we started in March of 2018, I had absolutely no connections in New Albany or Lexington. So it was also an incredible process to build that from the ground up. And so um, just another thread I think that's important and that you guys may also have this at your respective institutions. M Partner happens to sit at the base of one of the four pillars of our strategic plan. It was brought to us by former Chancellor Jeffrey Vitter, who um, was really intrigued by this model and this was a major push for his agenda. And M Partner sits at the base of this healthy and vibrant communities pillar which encompasses um, everything from diversity and inclusion to community engagement to experiential learning, um, which is a high impact practice for those of you that are sort of immersed in the, um, the work of George Koo and thinking about student success and retention. Um, so, so it's absolutely a key priority for our institution. And then, as I said, we, um, we are ambitious. And so we identified three partner communities in the pilot phase. And so Charleston, as I mentioned, is somewhere where we had a longstanding relationship with the director of the Wellness Center um, through our SEED initiative, actually. We had had multiple students complete internships with Dr. Mooring at the Wellness Center. Um, as you can see, the population of our towns, of our partner towns, is relatively small. Um, this is something that I was asking Marshall you know, earlier today on a separate call, but also before we even began the program, I looked at some of the exemplars out there and said, my goodness, you know, I think our community partners are, are relatively small in population compared to what other, um, what other universities have done. Another nuance is that our communities are at least an hour away from campus. Um, I have learned previously from different co-curricular community engagement work that that can be a serious challenge. Um, but I think the best practice that I would offer to you guys is that when the project is baked into the course design, you can really kind of minimize or work with that logistical barrier of distance. Um, so Charleston is located in the Mississippi Delta. It is a majority African American community. Um, I'm sorry that I didn't pull the demographics, but I would say, you know, this is a community that has struggled with population loss, but really kind of feels like they're at the precipice of something very, very big with this state of the art wellness center and a lot of intentional revitalization going on um, in the downtown area. Mayor Cedric Smith, our, our elected official partner in Charleston is the first African American mayor ever to be elected in Charleston. So that is a, a huge source of pride, um, and, and that is just a little bit about Charleston. Lexington is two hours away from the University of Mississippi. So UM has a medical center in Jackson, which is two and a half hours from Oxford, but they actually have a branch of the hospital located in Holmes County in Lexington. And so um, that was a really, really wonderful way to facilitate community entry vis-a-vis -vis the medical center. There was a really big push from our university leadership to involve the medical center and the Oxford campus. And we were able to do this through our School of Pharmacy because they have a presence both in Oxford and at the medical center in Jackson. Um, Lexington is also majority African-American. I would say their, um, their population, the mayor made this joke about how they used to be a city and now they're a village because they dropped below that 2000 threshold. Um, so the population loss, which is you know, very, very common in many of the Delta communities was something that was a great concern um, when we had our community meetings in Lexington. One, in addition to having the medical center, a really innovative thing that Lexington has going on that we learned about through this process is that they have um, an indoor farmer's market. And that indoor farmer's market is co-located with a senior um, voucher program that, that provides hot meals and distributes um, vouchers to purchase groceries. And so they're able to serve a really significant percentage of their seniors at the farmer's market by co-locating with that um, feeding program, which I thought was, we had a meeting with like the state um, ag folks and they were just raving about Lexington's approach to food security vis-a-vis -vis their farmer's market. Um, and then finally, New Albany is in Union County. So New Albany, I would say is a little bit of an outlier. Um, they're in Northeast Mississippi, it is majority white population um, and they are located on the I-22 corridor which connects Memphis, 
which as you know, is a major sort of intermodal distribution hub to, um, to Tupelo and Birmingham and, and other sort of larger cities. So Union County, I think the population in New Albany has grown. Um, there's a Toyota plant nearby, Ashley Furniture has some distribution centers and manufacturing centers. So, so there, New Albany to me felt when we started to have our community meetings, like they're in a very different place with regard to um, their community and economic development. And, and I realized that we're like starting to run short on time somehow already, but the reason that I mentioned sort of the racial background of each of the communities is that those of you may know that the University of Mississippi has a history of forced integration and we are continuing to have really, really powerful debates on campus about um, Confederate monuments and symbols of white supremacy. And so this is part of our campus dialogue really day in and day out. And I think that it does influence the reputation of our university when entering communities. And so I just offer that to say how important it was for us to go about building trust in all of these communities, but especially um, when going into the Mississippi Delta where the university doesn't doesn't have the first association is not always um, that the University of Mississippi is there to be an equal partner. So we really tried to set that tone um, with the M partner initiative. So like I said, we launched in March of 18 and then we set out to do a series of focus groups and community meetings where we identified the priority areas. And for some reason, I was expecting them to be very different in each community. Um, but what we heard, and I'm sure you guys hear this in all of your partner communities, they sort of collapse around the same four general themes. Um, people in the community are worried about the, the younger generation getting a great education and having job prospects at home. They're very worried about population loss. And so we heard a lot about educational attainment, um, job creation, business development, and economic development. We also heard um, a lot about wanting to be healthier communities, everything from the farmer's market to having access to food, um, like fresh food and grocery stores, bike lanes were a major emphasis. And then finally, all of the communities were really talking about beautification, which they connected to tourism, um, which they connected to wanting to have kind of a welcoming front door for, for any visitors coming through so that they would be able to increase tourism and therefore um, promote economic development. And so as we heard these things and as we assessed the infrastructure that we had at the McLean Institute and at the university, we, we decided that it just kind of happened to blend curricular, co-curricular and programmatic approaches, um, which really ended up having a very interdisciplinary feel to how we generated momentum for a partner. So these are big picture successes. Um, and it's a little overwhelming to look at this because I feel like this thing that has somehow generated a momentum of its own. Um, but we identified 27 priority projects. And I will say, we did not do all of them. If I had to do it over again, I probably would have um, pushed back a little bit on projects that just didn't seem well suited to any department that we have on campus. And the example that I've given in the past is um, there was a historical preservation project in one of our communities where I wish I knew that we just didn't have the right person on campus and I probably wouldn't have let that get to the list of priority projects. And so we certainly have not done all of them. Um, but my other approach has been if a faculty member comes to me and says, hey, I've, I'm, I'd love to like offer this resource to a community. It's a pilot. And so I say, absolutely, let's offer it. And they can always say no. Um, and so where we've landed is 33 courses and projects aligned with the M partner communities, programs and special events like those business forums are an example. Um, through curricular and co-curricular projects, we've touched 400 students with the involvement of 25 faculty and staff. Um, I would say one thing I'm really proud of is this Healthy Hometown Grant Award for Lexington, and that's the $50,000 that you see in the lower left-hand corner. Um, they wanted to be recognized as the healthiest hometown in Mississippi, and they got it. They worked with a professor of health promotion and some unbelievably talented undergraduate and graduate students submitted the grant, and they won. Uh, so that was a major victory that we had um, pretty early on, actually about a year ago in our pilot phase. 
So you'll see too that we um, we had 11 summer interns serving last year. This was something that was not initially contemplated um, in the M Partner Program model, but we had two donors come forward through our foundation and say, you know, if we were to, to give a contribution in X amount, what, what would you do with the money? And so I think I've been in higher education long enough to realize that working with students is always the right answer. And so I said, you know, well, we could create these um, summer internship experiences and the students can work under the supervision of our community partners. They can advance these priority projects because we had classes on the books in the spring of last year. We didn't have any, well, we had some that were like finishing up work over the summer, but we didn't have any classes that were summer classes. And I knew we had more stuff coming up in the fall. So I thought this would be a way to continue momentum. Um, and so I said, yes. And what we did is that we created like this common read for our summer internships. We read Worlds Apart by Cynthia Duncan, which is an ethnographic study of persistent poverty in the Mississippi Delta, Appalachia, and rural New Hampshire. And it was really awesome to see the students who are serving in three different communities synthesize their experiences, connect it with the literature. And, you know, this is clearly co-curricular, but I think they were able to get so much more out of it because we were treating them as a cohort. And then finally, um, the VISTA project, as Taylor mentioned, is another way that we generated momentum early on. Because if you all kind of heard that, um, that timeline, we launched it in March of 18 and then proceeded to do the needs assessment. We didn't follow the Epic M timeline, which I will be doing in the future. Um, but the launch happened, the needs assessment then proceeded, and so we just didn't have any courses on the books for the fall of 2018, because we had just we were just completing that process of identifying the priority projects. And so we thought, all right, how are we going to generate momentum um, and placements with the North Mississippi Vista project, both summer placements and then year-long placements starting that fall were one way that we were really able to fortify our community partnerships with key nonprofits um, in each of our unpartnered communities. And then, um, and I will segue that over to Taylor, another way um, that we generated that momentum was through Community Day. And something I've learned about our student body through this process is that, you know, our students are unbelievably service-minded, and I think that it's incumbent upon us to help them sort of extend that desire to serve into um, critical reflection on why is this service necessary and how can this you know sense of civic involvement become something that is baked into their course of study and their career aspirations whatever those may be and so um, because beautification projects were such a priority in our needs assessment process we said all right <laughs> community partners can we come on a saturday and can we just dispatch a whole tour bus full of student volunteers? And we actually had faculty and staff as well um, to work on your beautification projects. And that is exactly what we did um, in each of the three communities for two consecutive years. I, um, I think, you know, I went through that sort of transactional to transformational framework before, and I'm somebody that has really struggled with one off days of service, just philosophically. Um, but we decided, okay, we, are, we have to make this more than a one-off day of service. Um, and so, so as we did that, we thought we can really model these intentional ways of building trust and being respectful when entering communities, being mindful of sort of the systemic and organizational um, you know, level which, within which we're operating and then translating those principles down to the micro level, to how, as, as in interpersonal reaction, interactions, do we want y'all to live out those principles? Um, and so that is what uh, Taylor is going to share, how we sort of embedded all of that theory into some actionable steps for our student leaders to model for their peers on our large scale days of service. Right. So, like, as Laura said, we, the kind of volunteer structure of community days, we have a team of team leaders, which they're, Laura said, they're student leaders, and then we have you know, student faculty, staff, volunteers. Um, team leaders, to be a team leader, they go through a, it ends up being about two and a half hours in total of pre-service training. Um, that pre-service training, we kind of break up into two bits. Um, the first part is an orientation that's focused around introducing a partner in the day of service. Um, we also talk a lot about expectations of team leaders, which you can see on the screen. Um, and community entry. 
Um, we set very clear expectations for the roles that senior research had to play on the on the day of service. Um, you can see some of the expectations there. In the same vein, we have very clear expectations for how to enter communities. We talk about this quite a bit. Um, I think one thing that we, all of this we heavily emphasize, but one thing that just kind of comes up a lot is that we, the team leaders for everyone from the university is an ambassador for the university, city, and in partner. Um, and that this is an opportunity um, and to uh, take take the, the seat as a, as a learner and through all this. Um, <clears throat> So uh, the second part of the pre-service uh, training focuses on exploring individual and group identities. Um, we also talk about biases. Um, and this is all kind of, uh, we talk about how identity is personally held and socially constructed. That kind of frames our conversation. And all of this is leading up to um, how to lead a reflection on the way back to campus. Like Laura said, the, the bus ride to and, the, to and from the communities, we have a minimum of a two hour round trip. Um, we, we utilize every single minute of that, of that bus ride. Um, on the way back, the reflection uh, discussion is kind of facilitated by the team leaders and we, we give them tools to facilitate that conversation um, constructively. Um, these are some of the reflection questions, kind of examples that we use with our volunteers from the way back that open ended. Um, we, uh, uh, the reflection is a really powerful part of community day. Um, as I say in the handout that we give to volunteers, reflection helps us think critically and make connections to broader issues of equity and opportunity. And that's just the way we kind of take, as Laura said, this kind of transactional day of service and make it into something more, to make it into something that isn't just one off, but it's something that actually does build momentum. Um, this is something of when, uh, when we're instructing team leaders how to lead reflection and tell them to keep these things in mind. Um, and I guess it's honestly, when I was looking at this slide again, um, I think it's just a good thing to keep in mind with our program in general. In general. Um, we also, just a note about the ground rules, I think, Reflection is such a big part of in partner program as a whole. Is that the as part of the intention and the intentionality on the ground rules for discussion is something that um, is kind of used to help guide those discussions. And we have those in like a one pager that we give the, the team leaders. Um, in addition to that one pager for how to lead discussion, we give them lots of resources. That's what I'm, I think it really bolsters what, that this is a co curricular service opportunity. Um, we, uh, the Google Drive, we organize those all in, in a Google Drive folder. Um, the Google Drive folder for team leaders is tasks here, um, contain digital copies of all the materials and presentations that we use for the pre-service trainings, recommended readings on being an agent of change, identity and biases, poverty, uh, tools for leading reflection, and digital copies of everything that they would be receiving on the day of service so they could go over them and be fully prepared for the day of. Um, so we incorporate reflection, readings, and contextualization into community day to try to make it much more than just a single day of service. While the ultimate goal of community day is to work on community-identified projects, it is also important for the sustainability of the partner program. The volunteers walk away from this day with a better understanding of the importance of community engagement and the knowledge that their efforts as change agents are magnified through meaningful conversation and mutually beneficial partnerships within their community. I think a really good example of like it's like a success story, um, <laughs> as it was mentioned earl earlier, on their last year, the their student named Brad, um, who was a community day volunteer in our community in Charleston. He really enjoyed his time in Charleston, and he felt and he felt empowered by our reflection discussion and the interactions we had with the community. And now he is completing a, a grant writing project in Charleston this semester. So that's uh, through one of his courses. Through one of his courses. Mm -hmm. um, so as you see, we pack lots into our days of service. Um, another thing we do after each day of service on the bus ride home is a post service, post -service survey. Um, the data from this survey helps us gauge student attitudes on community engagement. If you're already in the EPIC program, this is different from the, the survey that you give like with the academic course. Mm -hmm. um, 
But yeah, so this is, we currently have 144 respondents to our survey. Um, of these 144 respondents, we only have two negative comments, so not bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, almost all the students say that they enjoyed and the day of service and that they felt engaged and utilized at the project site. Almost everyone agrees that the day of service gave them a greater passion to serve in uh, the communities around them. And many note in their comments that this has rekindled a passion that had kind of been earned, that had been burnt out by empty feeling service or philanthropic opportunities. We have a large group population on campus, on campus and they're just like, all the community service I do is just raising donations. So this is great. And they get more involved with Imparter because of that. Um, and also you can see the last little kind of torrent um, almost everyone believes that survey should be an integral part of education, um, which is good for the sustainability of the important program and the work of the McLean Institute. Um, I, I love reading the comments and surveys. absolutely love them. There's some of my, the ones that really stood out to me on the bottom. Um, I think one of my favorite things from these comments is that student that says, serving with a partner, the amazing people from New Albany put it to perspective that I was serving the community and not just strangers. And that was just, that's just the kind of mindset that we're hoping to cultivate within with community engagement opportunities. So I thought that was really cool. That was awesome. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ben. All right. Um, so I know that we are running a little short on time. So Marshall, we'll kick it back over to you. Laura. <laughs> um, so. Thank you so much on behalf of the Epic Network and all our members. A big thank you to Taylor and Laura for their amazing time and energy. They really run one of the most intentional programs that spends a lot more time aligning all of the resources on campus that they can get at their hands on with their Epic program. Uh, we have some folks on the call who are just experiencing Epic again for the first time. I want to mention that they share with you a lot of ways they go above and beyond the bare minimum for Epic for the EPIC model to qualify, and they do an amazing job bringing in those resources uh, to kind of bring that intentionality and uh, all the resources on universities to bear through the M Partner or EPIC N program on their campus. We hope you can use some of the pieces they shared with you, but a next step might be a short conversation with me about your goals in your institution and finding similar programs that meet those goals, and I can help share with you uh, a lot of our uh, connections to EPIC programs that are in, in a similar context or a similar um, build as what you're designing. Some of our programs are in architecture departments. Some are like Laura and Taylor's. They're, they're housed in a center that has really deep ties with the engagement office and, and service learning. Uh, they're all different and that's the key piece and I don't want you all have to figure out your way through it to figure out what's going to be the best way to build this out with the lowest energy to put in to get to the point where Laura and Taylor have gotten their program. Again, this is just one and a half years in since Laura and Taylor started their program, and we'd like to see similar results for you. That's why I exist as a staff person. Uh, thank you again to Laura. Here's her contact information. Thank you again to Taylor. Here's her contact information. Um, it, it'd be great if uh, after this engagement, you can do a maybe a social media share about their work and uh, the Epic N work as well. Um, we have some upcoming events I'd like to share with you. Our conference is coming up in Indiana, Bloomington, April 5th through the 7th. Our registration ends February 21st. We might extend it to March 5th. We also have a big workshop going in Thailand to share the model. Uh, Epic Network calls are host monthly. These are open to anyone, just like this call was. So go onto our website, RSVP. If you can't come, still RSVP, because we'll send you the notes from the call afterwards. Uh, this next one's on Epic Life Hacks, which is for those folks who might be uh, working on programs like M Partner, and they're just trying to find ways to make their jobs easier. We'll be talking a lot about those things. And we'll have future training webinars like this posted on that events page as well. And I also want to show, just take a brief second, share my contact information with you. Again, uh, if you'd like to schedule a call with me to talk more about, you know, Franco, you mentioned in the question before we started, what's the activation energy needed to start this program? Those are the things I have a really good sense on and pulse of across all of our programs and happy to have a conversation with you about that if we don't get to it in the Q&A. Uh, I'd also like to take just one brief sec second to go and show you where this webinar will go as a recording afterwards to kind of highlight some of the resources we provide as a network. 
this is our member platform where if you have a login, you can go see all of our resources we offer to our paying members. Uh, we have forums, a toolbox with a whole bunch of resource documents and a project library of all the past projects that have a URL or abstract from all of our programs. Our courses page will be where this will end. Folks can come in, check out all of our courses that we've done in the past, look at uh, the webinar recording, as well as get the slides and curated resources that we put together with our expert presenters, and then also uh, give us feedback. Okay. Thank you again all for attending. Uh, you'll find slides if you're a member in our member commons, and we might even post it on the events page as this was a special promotionary deal to just check out our webinars. Thank you for attending and uh, this concludes the Connecting Co-Curricular Resources training webinar, and we'll see you next time.